And the British government said, slow your roll there, Lewis. We are not sending a young 26-year-old blonde woman to Tanzania to study apes without an escort. And by escort, they of course meant a man, um, right? They didn't want her to go without a man to protect her. And she said, okay, great, I'll take an escort. And she took her mother, Van. <laughs> so this is Van Goodall up on her left, on the beach at Gombe, and then in her tent. And so Van and Jane is who set, set up the study of chimpanzees at Gombe for the first two years. So Jane was walking into a place where the chimpanzees were very scared of humans. They had been hunted. Um, they were not comfortable with her being in their presence. So she did a very um, kind of, at the time, thought to be kind of a crazy thing. She just went to this place called Jane's Peak. And every day she sat in the same clothes with the same equipment and was very just still and watched them across the valley and stayed very consistent, very predictable until the chimps kind of lost their fear from far away. And then she subsequently, over many years, was able to get them to lose their fear from very close up. Um, Jane, you know, much like her mentor, Lewis, there were kind of two things about her. She was very um, bold and brave and kind of wanted to do things her own way. She also didn't have any formal college education. She had only gone to secretary or school. So she decided like, oh, the best way to get to understand these animals is to study them as individuals. I'd like to learn who they are. I'd like to know their personalities. I'd like to learn about who their friends are, their emotions. And she did crazy things like giving them names instead of using numbers to identify them. And the scientific establishment at the time was like, that's really cute, sweetie, but like, that's not the way we do things. Um, and now here we are 60 years later, <laughs> and the Gombe study is still going strong, as I'm evidence of standing in front of you. So what Jane really changed in the, in the field of studying animal behavior was making it okay eventually to think about these animals in terms of being individuals, with individual personal relationships, friendships, personalities, emotions, um, and really conducting close observation of individuals and their individual stories. That's what was really different about Jane's study with the chimps. Now, Jane was one of these trimates, as I mentioned before, and what's really interesting about these three is they really did operate kind of like siblings. So this is kind of a story you have to dig, dig to, to find out, but Jane was very much the older sibling, like the responsible, you know, one. Um, Diane has been reported to be the kind of the, the jealous middle sibling. And Brute was like the happy baby who's just happy to be there with everybody. Um, and so the, Lewis kind of set up this system where after Jane's study became a success and he met Diane, and Diane, very similar to Jane, walked up to him and said, I want to do what she did, but with a different animal. He had this proving ground for Diane and then Barute. And what he did was he would first send them to Van Goodall in London. They would have to stay with Van for several weeks until she determined that they were okay. And then he would send them to Jane in Gombe so she could field test them and make sure they were okay. Now, no, but Jane has never revealed what these metrics were, so um, we don't know. But at any rate, Diane passed the test and ended up, as I'll cover later at Karasoki, What's interesting about um, Diane is, is, like Jane, she always had more of an affinity for animals growing up than the normal girl. Um, she actually got along with animals quite much more than she did with people. She had a difficult childhood, and she was desperate to be a veterinarian, but she was really bad at chemistry and physics. So instead, she became an occupational therapist with children. She was actually fully fledged in her career when she saw Louis Leakey give a talk and walked up to him afterwards and said, that's what I want to do. And so in 1967, Jane started Gombe in 1960, Diane went out in 1967 to Rwanda and started the Karasoke Research Center and the long-term study of mountain gorillas there. She did take a page out of Jane's book and really think about studying these animals as individuals with individual stories and histories and, and aspects to them. She habituated the animals to her presence, much less like Jane did. And she did end up forging a very close relationship with a particular animal, a particular gorilla named Digit. And that's Digit there looking at her field notes with her. Um, <laughs> Digit, you know, they really, really accepted Diane into their, into their community there, the gorillas. 
And so she forged this very strong bond with Digit. She has written about this as he was like her, her true best friend. And he really greased the wheels with the other gorillas. Like he accepted her and the other gorillas were like, oh, okay, she must be all right. So Digit really paved her way here. And this was a friendship that would last all of Digit's life. Uh, this picture was taken 10 years later. Digit's a fully grown adult gorilla who would seem to be quite terrifying to sit next to but they were, they were very close friends until his death. Now, his death is what changed Diane's life forever. So Diane, in a morning in 1977, got a report that poachers were in her area in Rwanda. She went out to check her groups, and she found Digit with his head and his hands removed. Um, so she went, did a full 180 at that point from behavioral research and went 100% into anti poaching and protection of the gorillas in her area. And her methods for doing this were quite unorthodox. They were outside of what we would envision as any, you know, kind of standardized conservation practices that we would do today. Um, she really chased, she basically chased after the poachers with like a knife and chased them off. And so her, her, her anti-poaching efforts brought a lot of anger to the poaching community, and in 1985, she was killed in her research camp in a crime that has never been solved. So she is buried next to her best friend, Digit. You can actually visit her grave site in Rwanda. So Diane's personal story is over, um, but there is a legacy of both these women that I just want to touch on before I, I launch into what I specifically work on. Um, Jane is very much with us. She's very much alive and well. She has more energy than all of us in this room. Um, her legacy is very strong. This picture in the middle is taken of a, a group of either current or former researchers at Gombe taken about two years ago. Um, Jane, let me see if I can work this thing. Jane's here in the middle. I'm over here. Um, so this was taken about two years ago. And then around you, you see where we've put um, a lot of focus in the last couple of decades is bringing into the formal um, research training our Tanzanian counterparts in Tanzania. And there's several of our Tanzanian PhDs and, and veter doctors of veterinary medicine there. The Diane Fossey legacy, despite her passing many years ago now, is also quite strong. An incredible presence in Rwanda, working very cooperatively with the government in terms of both uh, behavioral research and anti-poaching. And Diane's legacy of especially involving women in field research is clear there as you look at the pictures around the, around the edges. 